Today's reading is from the Church Bible Philippians, chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. It's in the Church Bible, page 1179. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son of his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epiphorora Dilatus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For the long for all of you, and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor man like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, just as we begin, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this letter to the Philippians. Lord, we thank you that Paul uh, takes time to tell us about Timothy and Epaphroditus. Lord, we thank you for their examples of godliness and Christ-likeness as they look to the interests of others and as they serve sacrificially. Lord, may you change us and give us hearts that long to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I wonder if you ever had a role model um, my children seem to already have a role model, even my two-year-old son, because I've noticed he started copying my mannerisms, which is scary, to think how quickly they have learned uh, what I do and, and copy what I do. I, I wonder if you ever had a role model as a, as a, as a teenager or a child. Uh, I'll be honest, mine was, I, was a, I loved football, I loved Man United, and so mine became Cristiano Ronaldo. Now, I didn't know anything about him as a person, particularly, um, but I knew he had skill, uh, and so I wanted to emulate him. I wanted to have the football skills of him. Now, now we may say, if you're here and you follow the Lord Jesus as Christians, we, we don't have role models, we don't have examples. But I don't know if you ever, you know, wanted to be like another Christian because of what you see they can do. You know, um, I, I see these, these preachers who preach at conferences to thousands, and I think, wow, oh, I'd love to be like them. I don't know what they're like at home, but I'd love to preach to thousands. No offense, everybody. Uh, you know, not hundreds in Wellington or the hundred or so in Wellington, but thousands at a conference. I'd love to be like them. I remember when, when I first became a Christian as a teenager, I had this, you, I know it sounds bizarre. But I had this sense that to be a Christian, you know, what I, I looked up to Christians who, young men who could play the guitar, I thought, I need to be like them. I need to be Graham. You know what I said? Yeah. That, that's what I thought. That's, that's, that's who I sort of made as my, again, nothing to do with their character. I didn't necessarily know what they were like. But I thought, as a young Christian, you know, I need to look up and be like them. I don't know, again, if you've ever just desired a, a talent or, or honor due to the skill of what we can do. And there's nothing wrong in some respect with, uh, with Christians that are great preachers or great musicians. We rejoice and give thanks we have them. But there is a, there is a danger that we might make our oh, examples of Christ, of Christ, the people we honor, just the most articulate, confident, impressive. 
And perhaps we're in danger then of, of just making role models like we see everywhere else. It's all about what they do, their skills, their talents, and less about who they are. In Philippians, uh, we see examples. We're called to imitate people. Uh, we're called to imitate Christ. Obviously, we can't imitate him completely. But chapter 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. We're meant to consider Christ and live like him. Uh, Paul calls us in chapter 4, verse 9, to imitate uh, what you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. But as we see here, two examples of godliness. I wonder what you notice is lacking. What isn't here? What are we not told? I'm not in many respects told what Timothy has done more than what he cares about. And with Epaphroditus, I'm not given a long list of why he is the best messenger for Paul to send to the Philippian church. I'm not told why that Epaphroditus is the best at traveling on sea and land, however we got from Rome to Philippi. But I'm told about who he is, his sacrifice. And even here, we see something of Paul as well. And so what this passage is helping us to see, among, uh, and primarily, is two people we should honour. And we see that in chapter, uh, chapter 20, verse 29. Sorry, Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honour men like him. This is who we should hold up, who our role models should be. And I'm going to look at Timothy and Epaphroditus in turn. But first, just again to remind us where we are in the book of Philippians. Paul uh, has told us he's in Rome under house arrest. He's, sent, he's speaking to the Philippian church in Philippi. Um, his longing for them is that they grow in their love of the Lord Jesus, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Um, he longs that they would continue with progress in their faith, and this will bring them much joy. He reminds them they will suffer for Christ. And in, the last, in chapter 2, he's called them to be like Jesus, having looking to the interests of others and not themselves, to work out their salvation with fear and trembling, to shine like stars. He's writing to believers, those who put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we come to this passage, although I've tried to give it a big introduction, you might be forgiven for thinking, well, this is just Paul's travel plans. That's all it is. It's just his itinerary of who he's going to send and when. Right? That's all it is. Okay, you know, he wants to send Timothy to them. Great. And he wants to send Epaphroditus. Wonderful. But as I've said, this passage is more than that. It's a call for the Philippian church to honour people like this. And as Paul repeats the language he's used already, we see that actually these are examples of Christ-likeness, of what it means to follow Jesus. So let's look first at Timothy. Timothy models Christ-like concern for others. Timothy models Christ-like concern for others. So Paul in time, that's quite important, longs to send Timothy to the Philippian church, 2.19, and he's confident that he will be cheered by the news he receives from them. He's confident that the Philippians will keep going in the Lord. He's confident that the, the Lord will carry out that work to completion. He knows that he will have great joy in hearing about the fruit of righteousness they have. But then we see a commendation of Timothy. And again, it's not that Timothy is a great messenger. You know, maybe he's good with his ink pen, not ink pen, whatever he would have used to write. Uh, it's not that he's a good traveler. It's what he's like. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Timothy is held up as a unique example of godliness. I realize that, that Paul then holds up Epaphroditus, so it might not be that he, by everyone he means every single person ever, but clearly he's, he, he's referring to, as in Rome, those he's already mentioned who preach Christ out of selfish ambition. But Timothy is not like them. He's genuinely concerned for their welfare. And as I said, this, this applies to us because it echoes chapter 2, verse 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And here is Timothy modeling that for 
the Philippian church and then we have to see what that looks like. But the question is, what is the Philippians' welfare? Is it just are they eating their vegetables, uh, tidying their room, I don't know, um, uh, and carrying on well? Well, again, we must let the letter guide what that must mean. And it's clear that Paul's concern for the Philippian church is that prayer in 9 to 11. Your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He longs for them to keep going, to to bear fruit in obedience. He longs for them to know joy. Verse 25, I'll continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. As they progress in the faith, he longs for joy. And we'll see as well, he longs for unity as well. That they would be united together. That they would work out their salvation with fear and trembling. So ultimately, this is what Timothy is going to do. He's going to go, and and Paul seems confident that he'll be cheered when he receives news of them. But Timothy is genuinely concerned for their spiritual welfare. He genuinely cares for them. And we see that that's a Christ-like thing. Verse 21, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Timothy is someone who doesn't care about himself, but cares about the Philippians' welfare. Honouring Christ. And it's not just that he cares, but he's proven himself, verse 22. As son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Timothy is a genuine gospel partner. Again, something Paul rejoices that he has with the Philippian church. Here's an example of someone who served faithfully with Paul. Like a son with his father. Now, I know modern pictures of sons and fathers, we might not imagine that, but I think, think of the father and the son following in the same business. Imagine as the father teaches the son uh, the, the job they have, passing on that work, as the son rejoices that they get to spend time with their dad as they learn that business. So Timothy is like that. He served with Paul in the work of the gospel. He he's, has a proven character a genuine concern for others. And the thing about this is sometimes it's not always seen, is it, your motive? For example, if I ask you right now, why am I preaching today? What, what do you think it might be? You might say, well, Harry, it's because you were voted to do so. It's your job. Get up and do it. Fair enough. Um, I might say, well, it's because I did philosophy and politics at uni. Very exciting. Uh, And there's no real natural thing to do after that. You know, it's not like it's an obvious career path. Um, I need something that would just about pay the bills, as a house included. So I'll be a minister. Why not? So I'm just doing this just to get by day to day. My motive might be that I genuinely want to be that big Bible preacher. And as far as you're concerned, you are all the stepping stone for greater things. Bigger, bigger churches, bigger congregations, bigger conferences. I think we see all those motives are not chapter 2, verse 4. That, you know, each should look not only to their own interests, but also to the interests of others. Though all those motives were entirely about me and my glory. But actually, as I see in Timothy, who's going to minister to the Philippians, my motive should be that of his, a genuine concern for your welfare for your spiritual welfare, that you would keep going with the Lord Jesus. Which means we might not talk, I, might not be able to have to say, I might not be able to say easy things all the time, but my longing and prayer for you as I, as I minister is that you grow in your spiritual welfare. And as I said, I, although Timothy is unique in the sense he's uniquely sent by Paul, he has a unique ministry in the, in, in the wider scriptures. Paul writes letters to him. Here we see that Paul repeats something he's just said to all the Philippian church. And so you might say, well, Harry, I'm not a minister. That's true. You might serve in another area. But I'd ask you to consider why. Is it for that reason? For genuine concern for people's welfare? And even if you serve this morning just by talking to someone after coffee, uh, at coffee time, sorry, might we do that with each other, with a genuine concern for each other, A genuine concern that we would grow in the faith, that we would keep going, that we would know joy. 
Now, um, Timothy serves as a wonderful example of that, and he will go uh, before Paul, and it's, he needs to tell the Philippians this. I hope, therefore, to send him soon, as I see how things go with me. Remember, Paul's under house arrest, but he's confident the Lord that I myself will come soon. So Timothy's going to be a pre-runner to help to give Paul uh, good news. That's right, a brief letter back. Um, and then Paul is confident he will come soon, once again, to share in the joy with the Philippian church of following Christ. And then we have Epaphroditus. We have the future plans. Paul is letting the Philippian church know, Timothy's coming, I will come soon. And then we have Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus is an example of sacrificial service. Epaphroditus is an example of sacrificial service. We're to- the Philippian church are told to honour men like him. What is it Paul told them to, why should they honour him? Because he almost died for the work of Christ. The sacrificial service. Again, we see Paul's affection and compassion for Epaphroditus. He refers to him not just as a brother, but a fellow worker and fellow soldier. Someone he has been closely partnered with, who he values as someone who's walked with him, who's partnered with him, but is also your messenger who's partnered with the Philippian church, who was sent to take care of my needs. We learn in chapter 4, where he gets another shout out, verse 18, that he had uh, brought a gift to them. That's how he was caring for Paul's needs. But we also see in Epaphroditus, again, a sense of compassion for the Philippian church. For he longs for all of you in his distress because you heard he was ill. Now, he's not, he, he, he's not, Epaphroditus is not concerned that the Philippian church needs to know the long extent of his email, his own interest. You know, I was very sick, people in Philippi. Send me a gift. Send me someone to come and pick me up. No. He longs for all of them. He's still concerned with their interests. He's distressed for them because they heard he was ill. He's not distressed by his illness. And this becomes even more striking when we read verse 27. He wasn't just struck down by the common cold. He was ill and almost died. But as Paul rejoices of God's mercy, we see Paul's heart of compassion for him. Paul says, And not also on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Again, Paul's demonstrating his gospel partnership with Epaphroditus. He loves him as a brother, a soldier, a worker, so much so that his death would have caused him sorrow. Sometimes we may read Paul and we think he's just a cold-hearted theologian, though that's a big word for someone who uh, tells us things about God. But actually here we see his heart, sorrow upon sorrow. He would have... Uh, He was so loved Epaphroditus as his brother that if he had died, it would have brought him sorrow too. Again, we see here just wonderful gospel relationships between these men as they serve together. But because of that, Paul is eager to send him so that when you see him, you, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. It will bring the Philippians joy. It will calm Paul's heart. And as they do this, we find now all the the information that's been given, we find the two things the Philippian church are called to do. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. Now Paul, as an example of sacrificial service, is a messenger. This is not a unique role that only certain people could fulfill. He wasn't the apostle Paul, that had a unique ministry that none of us can emulate as, in, as such. But Epaphroditus was just a messenger sent by a church that cared for Paul enough to send him a gift. In some respects, Epaphroditus is just the person in the church who they decided they should send. Perhaps the gospel-minded person that the church said, yeah, let's send him. And we shouldn't read verse 30 as, an, as a, 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 this isn't an issue for the Philippian church. Of course, um, they couldn't. Paul was miles away. He was in Rome. They were in Philippi. Epaphroditus was allowing, was serving them by giving the help they could not give because Paul was miles away. It's just a church community, brothers and sisters in Philippi, loving Paul, 
their, the person that planted their church. And so it seems to me that the thing we need to take from this is the attitude of honoring those like this. To pray, to rejoice over, to seek those, who, to, seek those to serve with these characteristics. To long to emulate these, these characteristics. Those that look to the interest of others. Those that serve sacrificially. And it's easy to get to, to value other things. And, and again, skills aren't bad, but they mustn't be the reason we, for everything. Imagine, for example, children and youth, or, or maybe AV. I think AV feels like the one where skills must matter above all else, right? If I'm not techie, I can't do it. Even though uh, I learn things throughout life all the time. But, you know, I'm techie, I can't do it. Or children and youth, I, I'm just, I just don't really like I'm not, you know, Children, no, I'm okay. But perhaps even in those two areas, what matters more is not that the children of the youth minister is young, charismatic, and down with the kids. That may, that may exclude James Miller. <laughs> or, or not that, uh, not that um, it's recorded so we can hear that later. Not that um, you know, the tech person is someone who can uh, you know, have three computers open and knows how to program them all. Perhaps what matters when we think about serving or when we think about who could serve, is your character, your heart. Do you want to serve sacrificially on... I mean, maybe a sacrifice of serving on the tech team is taking the time to learn it. I mean, that would be, I think, you know, the sacrifice for me and if I had to do that. Maybe our sacrifice with children and youth is also, again, attending the training, putting that time in. And, and we do that sacrifice not because, again, we're looking for the fame of being the the amazing children and youth helper, or the fame of being the person who can uh, you know, turn my volume down or change the camera position. But because we long to serve others. We long to, for them to grow in Christ-likeness. And, and, so, and then between us as a church family, how can we encourage and hold up and welcome with joy those like these examples? How can we make them our examples in faith? I know this series is about joy, and I haven't spoken much about joy, but I was just reflecting that the people that I rejoice over as I look back on my Christian life, I think actually many of them aren't, weren't the up-the-front people, or weren't the, weren't the kind of... They weren't the conference speaker, actually, although they're great. But they were just those faithful people in, in the churches I was at who quietly... Uh, without much shouting or hurrah, served the Lord, who, who generally cared for me, um, who would have a conversation with me even when I was a teenager and they were a lot older. I know everyone's old when you're a teenager, I understand that. But they were a lot older. You know, who would generally be concerned for my spiritual welfare, who would pray for me, probably even when I didn't know, <laughs> actually. There were those who I saw who, who served even when it was hard, even when it cost them. And as I think of those people, I realize I get much more joy out of thinking about them than I do the conference speaker, as much as they're useful. So I encourage us as a church, let us look and rejoice over, let us welcome and encourage, let us make our lives those that are Christ-like in our concern for others and our willing, willingness to serve with sacrifice. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this passage. This passage that at first glance appears completely irrelevant to us. A story of Paul's journeys and who he's sending where. But Lord, we thank you as, as Paul wrote this and as, as woven into these instructions and, uh, and, and things he's going to do for the Philippian church and who's going to arrive, we see great examples of christ -liness of those who were genuinely concerned for the interests of others, who those who modelled sacrificial service. And I pray for us that, again, skills are wonderful, people who are good at things are great. But we pray, Lord, we wouldn't value those above all things, but would value a heart, a person's character, that is genuinely concerned for others and that is willing to serve sacrificially. In Jesus' name, amen.